fifth chapter of Matthew. Again, the what I call the long version of the Sermon on the Mount. Because the short version is in the Gospel recorded by Luke. I'm thinking of the loftiest experience that can come to men, which is outlined for us there in the 8th verse, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. I don't believe there's anything greater than reaching, as, as David did in Psalm 51, when he said, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. The other night they showed a, what should have been a very elegant, beautiful mansion. It's one of those poor little boys in Dallas by the name of Hunt, you know. You know, every time you pull the sauce out, you help to keep their millions going. And one of them has built a magnificent mansion. And he had it all lined with uh, all the most exquisite furniture. I don't know where it hadn't come from and rugs that had come from India and whatnot. Just about a million dollars worth and somehow, I don't know how, and uh, I don't know if somebody took revenge on it, but the day before he was to go in, the night before he was to go in, it, it caught fire. And the whole thing was burned and, and uh, they just showed the entrance of the house. There was an exquisite piece of what looked like a kind of a Louis XIV desk there and it was all burned up at one side and the walls were scarred and half the pictures were burned and uh, uh, then it showed that uh, the section that was still new you know it, it looks so pathetic to see a thing like that that had cost so much money and uh, there's so much design in it there's so much expense in it and just when you think you've got the world at your feet uh, somebody puts a match to it and <coughs> all you have is a stack of ashes you know it made me wonder uh, how God looks at the world in which we live a world that he made so beautiful, a world that had no disease, it had no death, it had no deficiencies, it had nothing that would hurt or injure or mar. And then when he made it, he put a man in charge, he put a, 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 his most brilliant production obviously was when he made the, when he made man. He made man first, you know. <coughs> because the reason he didn't make woman first, he didn't want any advice after that. <laughs> So uh, man was made first and then out of the rib. You remember again that old American preacher said that God didn't take a bone out of his foot lest he thought, uh, well, I've got her under my feet, you know. Didn't take a bone out of his hand lest he thought he could punch her with it. He took a, uh, a, a rib near a heart, near his heart, <coughs> as a sign of, um, that he should love her and take care of her and so forth. But again, God made a beautiful universe. Now we see it shattered, marred by sin. We see human, humanism, we see everything that God designed is wrecked and defiled and uh, how does God look at this uh, existence that we have now? Uh, well, again, okay, so now let's leap back to the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is there on the mountainside and <coughs> he's conversing just with his disciples. And again, if he had started this sermon by saying, Blessed are the pure in heart, we feel pretty bad about it. But he begins by saying, Blessed are the poor. And you know, that, that's an attitude we have to maintain. Arrogance and pride quickly come back into the human heart. I'm still impressed with a statement that I read months ago, and it, it, it uh, disturbs you when you wake up at night sometimes, that we're in trouble, all of us are in trouble, when our spiritual attainments become the ground of our confidence. You see, I can do it. I mean, I've been preaching now six years, so what's preaching? Get up and say my piece. I can uh, recall something out of the repressed complex of my uh, subconscious, as Martin would say. And uh, <coughs> somewhere, a little chamber in here that sermons I've preached for years. So why get up? Why worry, you know? You, and, and we get confident of our ability. All of us, we can do. I, I, I say before God, it's a thing that I... I guard against because God says to this man will I look to him that trembleth at my word. I don't tremble at men, I've no nerves about men or women or demons, but I tremble lest that somehow I mishandle the word of God. Lest instead of the message becoming a stepping stone it becomes a stumbling block that somebody falls over. Now, now Jesus has uh, started again with this amazing thing, blessed are the poor in spirit. And I'm always impressed by reading the Psalms of David because so often you know, he was number one on the charts, you know what that means, <clears throat> with his guitar and everything. I mean, uh, can you imagine all Israel singing the 23rd Psalm? Or, or the uh, 24th Psalm, that always excites me. 
I think I was saying once in a, uh, talking to Buck and Annie and some of those guys there, I wish somebody would really write a real modern, wonderful melody to lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be lifted up your everlasting nose. And they said, well, of course, um, that kind of blotted out because Handel did such a good job, you see. Well, somebody else should get a handle on it. <coughs> uh, I'm sure there's more tunes than one that could be made, but that 24th Psalm is so rapturous. You see, the 22nd Psalm is the Psalm of the Cross. As I said on Sunday, it's an amazing thing that that psalm was written a thousand and fifty years before the crucifixion, before the Roman Empire, before crucifixion was known, and yet we've got 33 references to crucifixion in that 22nd psalm. That's the psalm of the cross. The 23rd is the psalm of the crook. You know, the shepherd's stick has a crook at the end. It reaches down. He can put it around the neck of a sheep without pulling its neck out. I'm sure I'd pull its neck out, but he doesn't. He can slip it under its leg and lift it out of a hole. So Psalm 22 is the psalm of the cross, and Psalm 23 is the psalm of the cross, and uh, Psalm 24 is the psalm of, of the coronation. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, it's showing. But again, David has written these psalms so that they turn their national song, they change their national anthem. Their anthem was what? Saul had slain his thousands. And they changed it to Saul had slain his thousands, but David is tens of thousands. And yet, though he's sitting on the pinnacle of fame there, <coughs> he still says, Bow down thine ear and hear me, I am poor and needy. You know, when we get to heaven someday, I, I, I just know what it's going to be like, I can't even guess. But I, I think sometimes when we see ourselves in our, in our natural state here, and, and adding to that our spiritual state, I mean our total personality, when we see our little shrink, shrunken selves, against the awesome majesty of God, I think we'll blush that we were a bit uh, so self-confident and had so much ability. You know, it's a high and lofty one who inhabited eternity. I still think, as I said Sunday morning, that I, I'm not against using the name of Jesus or the name of Christ, but in, in the world that means a man that everybody pushed around. But Paul says to Timothy, you know, the young man that's starting out, keep this in your mind, that when you're ministering, or when you're talking, or when you're praying, we're talking to Jesus. No, he doesn't say that. He says, we're talking to the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, who dwelleth in light and approachable. Now, we don't often see Jesus like that. We still see Jesus walking around streets, healing sick, somebody beating his jaw, somebody spitting in his face, and doing the other things which they certainly did. But that's past. We see him now triumphant. We see him resurrected. We see him in his majesty. He's the blessed and only potentate, no matter how many kings there are in the earth or how many there have been. Earth's proud empires have passed away, and he comes in all his solemn majesty and glory. And again, I like one modern song at least that says it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. I think five minutes inside eternity we'll be weeping tears and wishing, oh God, I wish I'd carried a heavier burden. I, I wish I'd dared to say, Lord, lay on me what you can't lay on someone else. I often pray that. I pray it for you. So if you get a bad time sometimes, if you see uh, Keith going around nearly bowling under a load, you know, I pray for him. But, but that's what I want to do. I want God to give me something he can't give to someone else. I don't want to be me mediocre. Not for my sake, for his sake. The church of God is loaded with mediocrity. The assembly lines, they're going to crank them up this week. All the Bible schools are going to start again. The professor's going to bring his outline of uh, Romans chapters 1 to 7, 8 to 11, 12 to 16. Da, da, da. <laughs> You know, if he, if, he, if he fell asleep, you could put his tape record on, he wouldn't tell the difference, or you could have a parrot do it. Because it, it's so mechanical, you see, it's been done over and over and over again. No sense of... God knows and said a thing a while ago, Keith, a few years ago, I remember him saying this, I do not understand why in a Bible school you start teaching Bible at 8 o'clock in the morning and you have a break at 10 to go worship the Lord for 20 minutes in the chapel. What have you been doing the rest of the time? Picking cotton? And it's supposed to be inspired by that same holy word, and it becomes especially sacred because it's even an organ and a, uh, a bit of music. Why, why do we need the change? Except, of course, if we really worship God, it will be different. But there should be that awesomeness about the word of God wherever we handle it. I mean, it's, it's, it's the rarest, it's the most amazing thing in the world. Okay, so we go back to the, uh, the start here. Jesus says, blessed are the, the poor in spirit. But now we come to blessed are the pure, and there's a long way from the poor to the pure. A lot of amazing things. Those who hunger and thirst after righteousness have been filled, the meek, they shall inherit the earth, and all these other amazing promises. 
they that mourn shall be comforted they mourn over their sin mourn over the times they offended God mourn, mourn over the times that they defiled themselves mourn over the times that they they hurt God and trampled his laws underfoot and violated conscience they mourn and yet they come right round this circle and now they come to the place blessed are they pure in heart well do you know a religion in the world that talks about the pure in heart except Christianity Again, Christianity, there's a study of comparative religion, and it's, it's pretty interesting. The only thing is, the poor guys in school, this next uh, few weeks until, what's the next feast? Uh, um, Passover, no. Uh, homecoming, or what in the world is it? What is it you have in um, Turkey Day? Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that made you rejoice. <coughs> uh, between now and then, most people will be going around a treadmill anyhow. They, they do not realize again the majesty, the privilege of being a child of God. Okay, is there any other religion in the world offers out purity? Not one. What are the alternatives? Reincarnation, endless reincarnation. Boy, wouldn't you be worried after you've been reincarnated 3,000 times? Yeah. What's the Roman answer? The Roman answer is purgatory. Well, I don't believe in either of them. Just the other day, somebody talked to me about the Immaculate Conception of, 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 of Mary, you know, the, uh, what's the statement in, um, in, in Luke? Luke chapter 2. Oh, well, let, let, let me go back here. Let's go back into, um, into the Old Testament a little while here. Let's go back to, let me see where. Um, Exodus, Leviticus. Okay, Leviticus, the 12th chapter. Leviticus 12, verse 1. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, If a woman hath conceived seed and born a man-child, then she shall be unclean seven days. According to the days of the separation of her infirmity shall she be unclean. Come down to verse 8. If she be not able to bring a lamb, then she shall bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons, the one for the burnt offering and the other for the sin offering. And the priest shall make an atonement for her, and she shall be clean. Now go over then to um, the scripture we were going to read in Luke chapter 2. And verse 22 says, And when the days of her, that is Mary, the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. Now, to offer, that's a parenthesis, to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord, which we've just read, a pair of turtle doves and two young pigeons. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. Now, okay, so Mary is immaculate. Mary does have not have any original sin, <coughs> according to Roman theology. But not it is very emphatic in the 22nd verse of Luke 2. And when the days of her purification according to the law of Moses were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. But who was the purification for? For Jesus? No. Because he had no sin. The purification, obviously, and it's stated here, the purification was for Mary herself. Now again, we go back over to, um, to Numbers chapter 19. Numbers 19 and verse 1, The Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, This is the ordinance of the law which the Lord hath commanded, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they bring thee a red heifer without spot, wherein is no blemish, and upon which a yoke never came. Verse 6, The priest shall take the cedar wood, the hyssop, the scarlet, and cast it into the midst of the fire, in the midst of the burning of the heifer. Then the priest shall wash his clothes, and he shall bathe his flesh in water, and afterward he shall come into the camp. For what reason? Verse 9. A man that is clean shall gather up the ashes of the heifer and lay them upon, and lay them up without the camp in a clean place, and it shall be kept for the congregation of the children of Israel for a water of separation. It is a purification for sin. Now notice what the sins are. 
Verse 11, he that toucheth the dead body of any man shall be unclean seven days. This is the old law. Verse 12, he shall purify himself on the third day, and the seventh day he shall be clean. Verse 13, whosoever toucheth the dead body of any man that is, uh, 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 whosoever toucheth the dead body of any man that is dead and purifieth not himself, he defileth the tabernacle. So he's not only defiled himself by touching the dead, he spreads contamination. In verse 14, this is the law when a man dieth in a tent, that all that come into the tent and all that are in the tent shall be unclean. Verse 16, whosoever toucheth one that is slain with a sword in the open fields, or a dead body, or a bone of a man, or a grave, shall be unclean. Now, skip back to a scripture that I intended to speak about on uh, last Sunday, and I didn't go, go back to Hebrews. This is one of my favorite scriptures. <clears throat> Hebrews for me, chapter 9. It would be good if sometime, when you have a few minutes, you go through this chapter <coughs> and notice again how many, how many times the blood is mentioned. <coughs> now here in this verse, in verse 10, for me, in verse 12. Neither by the blood of goats and of calves, but by his own blood he entered in once and, uh, unto the holy place having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies to the what? Purifying of the flesh. How much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot unto God purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Now I read that previous chapter there so you could see the defilement that came to man <coughs> If he was digging in his garden and he touched the bone of a dead animal, he was ceremoniously unclean. Now his conscience wasn't unclean because he hadn't violated any law, but ceremoniously he was unclean. <coughs> Death came because of sin. And they were perpetually reminding themselves that whenever you touch death, that's the penalty for sin. And they abhorred it. Uh, if you touch the dead man, if you're plowing in a field and you turned up a bone, you were ceremoniously unclean. If you walked into a tent and a body was laid down, you didn't know somebody died, you walked in, you were unclean. If you took that, you, if you walked into the sanctuary, you defile the sanctuary. Now, now they knew, you see, here's a, here's a very interesting thing, and I'll be honest with you, <laughs> I've read that chapter, the, the fifth chapter of Matthew for 60 years, I'm sure, maybe nearly 70, and you know, I never realized on today, until today, that the eighth verse, blessed are the pure in heart, is not in the shorter version in Luke. You see, Matthew was a Jew, and he was writing to Jews. There are lots of people that, that hardly touch Matthew at all, because they say he was a Jew writing to a Jew, which is right. So they knew more about purification than anybody else on earth. They knew how many different laws there were about purification. Purification for this person, purification for the priest, purification for this defilement, purification for something else. There were different degrees, there were different offerings. Now, Paul again, he's right at Paul, I think, I think Paul wrote Hebrews, <coughs> but anyhow, whoever it was, the Holy Ghost, he says this, if the blood of bulls and goats, he's writing to Hebrews again, he's writing to people who know the law. What is the epistle to the Hebrews? People say, well, uh, you know, it's not like Romans, Romans has uh, to the saints in Rome, and uh, uh, Thessalonians to the saints of Thessalonica, and uh, there's well, there's, there's no title to the uh, letter to the Hebrews. Yes, there is in the third chapter. He writes to holy brethren. He writes to those who have been made partakers of the divine nature. But by and large, the epistle to the Hebrews is a commentary, a commentary on what? On the tabernacle, on the wilderness journeys of the, of the children of Israel, and on the book of Psalms. That's what it is. You know, I, I think all of this, and I'm, uh, I can't lay a law down here, but I think you will be very, very wise for maybe two years to specialize on one book in the Bible. Not read Matthew today and Revelation tomorrow and Ecclesiastes another day and, and get up in uh, Chronicles reading the begats, the begats, the begats that don't mean too much anyhow, you get lost in them. Get down into Hebrews or something like that and read that book until you're soaked in it. See, one of, one of, the, uh, one of the phrases here, if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes and heifer sprinkling the, the unclean sanctifies to the purifying of the flesh, how much more 
Uh, you, you check how many times that's written in Hebrews. How much more? You see, the, 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 in Hebrews, Christ is the center and he's the circumference of the teaching. He's the beginning and the end. He's the light and the life. He's showing Jesus that whatever the priesthood of Melchizedek may have been or Aaron, that the, soup, the, the ministry of Jesus is far superior because they ministered somebody else's blood or something. Christ ministered his own blood. They talked about another sacrifice. He was a sacrifice. They talked about another altar. He is the altar. He's the combination of everything. He is a super excellent, if you like to say that. Okay, so the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of an heifer. You see, that red heifer had to be burned without the camp, and they really burned it. They, they really saw it just go down all the flesh until it was uh, a pile of ash, and then they pushed it on one side into a clean place, and then if you got defiled, if you contacted death by, again, digging in your yard, or uh, you'd gone to see a neighbor and found him dead, you were unclean, you went along and asked someone else to take some of the ashes and, and put them in running water, and then they were thrown over your body, <coughs> and you were pronounced clean. Ceremoniously, you were, you were defiled. So he said, if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies to what? The purifying of the flesh then how much more, the much more which is mentioned so often in this epistle, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit, offered himself without spot to God? You see, you could not bring a lamb. You could not bring anything blemished. You couldn't take it to the tabernacle and say, well, I, I need to make a sacrifice, but go slow, this, this lamb is limping. You could not take anything that was limping. You couldn't take a beast that was blind in one eye. As far as possible, it must be a perfect a type, a perfect example of, of whatever type of beast it was. Well, Christ is the perfect lamb. How much more shall the blood of Christ? Well, who knew more about blood than the children of Israel? Remember when they had to slay a lamb? And, and, and it wasn't enough to say, well, well, listen, we've obeyed you. We killed the lamb. We've got the blood here. No, sir. Unless the blood is on the lintels and the doorposts, you could have the precious blood of the lamb there. You'll still die anyhow. You know, we've got lots of people who know a lot about the blood and they sing hymns, but the blood has never been applied. It's theological, it's mental. Yeah. I know a man, and, and, uh, and, and this guy is, um, well, anyhow, uh, he's a bit wild in the way he lives, but he will not miss sacrament. Man, he believes immediately, he takes that, uh, drinks communion wine and, and takes part of the body as he thinks of Christ, is absolved. Not so. I like the hymn I quoted last Sunday, not all the blood of beasts on Jewish altars slain. Have you ever tried to figure how many thousands of, of beasts were slain in altars? They, if you stack them up, they might be higher than that mountain. Rivers of blood, not all the blood of beasts on Jewish altars slain could give one guilty conscience peace or wash away one state, but Christ the heavenly Lamb takes all our sins away. A sacrifice of nobler name and richer blood than they. If the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of an heifer fulfills the law and it gets you cleansed so that now you can go and have fellowship with people, you can go into the tabernacle, uh, you can get back to your old status quo because you've been purified in the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit, you see there's the Father and there's the Son and there's the Holy Ghost. You know, I think the Catholics think the Trinity is Father, Son and Holy Mary. That's what most of them think. No, no, no who through the eternal spirit well I guess there are different ways of looking at that do you mean that in eternity they designed the death of Christ is it, is it through that eternal spirit is it the Holy Spirit is it his eternal spirit <clears throat> he offered himself without spot to God how much more shall the blood of Christ who through, through the eternal spirit offered himself so he didn't just offer a prayer for us he went to the high priest, he sure didn't offer himself. All he did was offer the blood of a beast. But Jesus doesn't pray here, he's not praying the prayer that he prayed in the 17th of John. He offers himself. As I tried to say Sunday, I, as I tried to visualize Barabbas seeing the crucifixion saying, that's my cross actually. I should be on that cross. How, how do you think he really felt? Do you think, to use a rough term, that on the gut level he felt, uh, something like that, I should be hanging there uh, with my body sagging on, uh, sagging on those big nails, I, I should be cursed, I should be spit upon uh, uh, do, 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 do you think he saw himself there like that? 
Do I see myself there that, that in my place condemned he stood and sealed my pardon with his blood? He offered himself without spot to God. That's why I think, you know, the scripture talks about Jesus, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. I, I can't do it, nobody can. I cannot understand the emotions of Jesus because he was dying as a man, you know. He wasn't dying just as a God, he was dying as a man. Can, can you think of all his history from his infancy flashing through his mind? What was the one thing that kept kept him really going, if you like, in that? Because God's going to do that to him anyhow. Who for the joy that, what was the joy that was set before him? I believe I only know one thing, and that was he was doing the will of his father. I believe that was the joy of the father. He looks down and said, my, my son has never questioned my dealings. My son has been in the, in the sanctuary more than once when they've read the 53rd of Isaiah. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. See, the other guys thought they were bruising him. No, it was the Lord that was bruising him. They thought his body was a sacrifice. No, no, but when thou hast made his soul an offering for sin. Well, if the blood of bulls and goats is sufficient to cleanse us ceremoniously, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, now it comes down to something inward. Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. See, it doesn't matter how good a man is, what people have tried to do to be holy, they've run away to monasteries, they've run away to convents. Maybe you've never read the story of Simon Stylite. He, he built a he, ha he had a <coughs> family, he had a tower built, 40 feet high. And he had an iron fence put round it, railings put round it. I don't know how they got him up there, they didn't have any cherry pickers in those days, but anyhow, he got on top of that 40 foot tower and lived there more than 20 years, he never came down. He had an iron collar made, so he had to look up at all the time. You imagine how uh, his skin must have been burned and... Uh, I don't know how he lived, uh, ran to the bathroom or what, but there he was on top of that pillar for over 20 years because he wanted to be holy. He said, if, if you look on a woman going past, you'd have unholy thoughts. If you saw a prosperous man, you'd have the thoughts of covetousness. This is the only way to be holy. Yeah, yeah. And he died in stupid misery. Another way, they used to find a cave, and then they used to put a block at each end, and then put a, a tree trunk on it, and then with about uh, 8 inches or 10 inches of space there, they built the wall up, and, and they just put the, the, the food under there, years and years, and, and then, if they didn't answer, they knew they were dead. And then they'd break the wall down and find a man whose skin was as parched and, and yellow as that lampshade, and, and he'd be a freak and an idiot. And he'd been in there with, with all that filth, all his own mess that he'd made, stinking of urine and filth, he'd been there, believing that somehow he was making atonement for sin, and he denied the world, and this was a way of righteousness, this was a way of holiness. It's amazing how weird people can get, isn't it? Yeah. And yet, isn't it, isn't, it, isn't, it, isn't it really a proof of our pride that people will not bow at the cross and get what they really want? You see, every religion in the world deals with sin. Only one religion deals with it adequately. Oh mercy, what pilgrimages they have. What indulgences they get. Man, you go around India, you still see uh, men with one arm up like that. It, it, uh, you know, it was, it was a sign of, of devoutness. And the arm atrophied and, and it's gone stiff and you couldn't get it down. You couldn't even know where you can pull it down. That's a sign of his holiness. You still see men by the river Ganges. I remember going down by the Ganges there. There's a man with an ulcer on his back. I'm sure it was that size. It was open. It was dripping blood. It was dripping pus. And he was standing in the Ganges throwing water over himself. <laughs> and the next guy's drinking it. And in all kinds of things, there's a temple, I didn't go in it, because it, it has more than a million gods in. If you lift them up and look underneath, they're made in Birmingham, England, but anyhow, that's what a friend told me, he went in one temple and these little gods were made in Birmingham, England. Some guy was cursing while he was making them and spitting on them and everything, but they've been declared holy. What, what, what rigors, what, what, um, Discipline people will go through, thinking they can put down the flesh, thinking that they can merit something. And, and it, it's still the same old way, you know, when it comes down to the nitty gritty, nothing in my hands I bring, but simply to thy cross I cling. Now again, having gone round there, you do not find anybody pure in heart unless they've been to the cross. And unless they've been to the upper room. 
That is no other way of cleansing. If you leap over to the uh, next chapter, uh, pardon me, the tenth chapter there in Hebrews, <clears throat> verse 22 says, Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. You know that word pure there, that's uh, the pure in heart in, in uh, Matthew, what is it, Ma Matthew 5, 8. It's translated clean in the New Testament ten times. Because there's always a variation in Greek words. Ten times that word pure is, 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 is translated as, as, um, as clean. Once it's translated as, <coughs> as clear, and uh, 17 times it's, it's listed as, as, uh, as pure. Hebrews 9, 13, 14 that we've dealt with here. The blood of bulls and goats, the ashes of an heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctify for the purifying of the flesh. But then there was almost instant defilement because there were so many laws laid down. Now, now I'm convinced in my own mind that the weakness of modern Christianity and modern preaching is this, that we do not preach salvation, we preach forgiveness. A man needs more than forgiveness, he needs more than the guilt being removed. He needs cleansing in that area where there's been defilement. He needs more than cleansing, he needs indwelling. Jesus said if there's a room in which there are evil spirits and you kick them all out, unless another occupier comes, worse spirits will come and occupy that area. See, that's the danger again of transcendental meditation. That's again, uh, 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 the danger again of just uh, sitting down, you know, passively and letting your mind go, man, you can go through all kinds of junk. There's got to be concentration in meditation. There's got to be, there's got to be the motive of love. I'm here not to benefit myself so much as to, as to give him the adoration which is due to his name. But you can't offer anything to God in the Old Testament that's defiled or stained. It must be pure. Now again, there's no religion I know of in the whole wide world that offers purity of heart except the Christian religion. Uh, look at First Peter, the first chapter and what, verse 22. Another uh, scripture I like so much. Uh, 1 Peter 1, let's take verse 21. Who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God, seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. Now there can be no fervent love if there's an impediment there. You can't love fervently if there's a secret bitterness or a secret jealousy, or a secret covetousness. Now, now Peter says, hey, you, you have purified your heart. He's not saying this is a self-effort. You know, I, I get a lot of encouragement out of reading Peter because I think I'm a bit like him, I have been in many ways. And when I find Peter, beginning this epistle, Peter an apostle. What do you mean, the dropout? Yeah, Peter, Peter was a dropout. Again, as I tried to say Sunday morning, you see that when Jesus meets him on the resurrection morning, he says, and if the other disciples are there, and you know, people have said all kinds of things about uh, Jesus asking him three times, lovest thou me, you know. And some say, well, because he denied Jesus three times, he got three opportunities to repent. Or lovest thou me more than these, these, uh, your business around here. I, I don't think that. I think that Jesus there is saying, here are all the other disciples. Do you love me more than these? You're the man that swore, look, everybody else will let you down. I won't let you down. Now, Peter, lovest thou me more than these? You see, again, we, we put such stress on our works. Now, I believe we love God. God can ask anything of us. But on the other hand, you can work yourself to death and not earn salvation. Maybe not even earn any reward. If the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling them clean, sanctified, to the purifying of the flesh, and then it, can t it, it speaks about our dead works. Well, outside of Christ, all our works are dead. That's why it's a shame that people give their lives the way they do, sacrificially, and, and deny themselves, and you get people who might have been the leading scientists, or doctors, or something else in the world, that 
one day they decided to jump into a monastery, walk this lousy life outside, go to go there and deny yourself. But in itself, that's not sufficient. It must be done, done out of love. It must be done out of the motivation of love for God himself. <coughs> And, and, and Jesus doesn't say again to Peter, oh, well, uh, what are you doing while I'm away? Huh? Have you evangelized? Have you been having street meetings? Have you been on the beach testifying? Have you been tithing? Have you been healing with it? He poses the question three times, love us thou me? Come on, come on, tell me, do you really love me? Do you really love me? Do you really love me? And Peter's grieved. Why are you putting so much pressure on me for? All these other guys are looking, why are you asking me? Because you're the man that said so devoutly, well, Lord, I know what other guys are made of, but you can trust me, I won't let you down. You see, the first and greatest thing is, what is the first and greatest commandment? The first and greatest commandment is, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and soul and mind and strength, and then thy neighbor as thyself. Well, we've got it turned round. It's like John says, what, what, our fellowship is what? With the Father, and with His Son, Jesus Christ, and with one another. But we turn it round. How many fellowship meetings do you have? How many people, uh, how many lot of people get together? Two or three nights a week now. One group told me up in Minneapolis there, at, at the house meeting. Oh, we, we meet together three times a week. I'm not saying it's wrong. They met together every day in the New Testament church. But it's wrong if it's become a substitute for meeting God, spending time with God, there's an awful lot in that hymn, take time to be holy, speak off with your neighbor. Does it say that? <laughs> well, speak often to the pastor, call him up, go to death, I'm feeling down. Well, who lives by feelings anyhow? Well, what's feelings got to do with spirituality? Jesus went in the garden of Gethsemane, feeling very heavy. You see, the, the devil's a cheat, he's a liar, he's a cheat. And, and he says, well, now you're not really filled with the Spirit. I mean, you wouldn't feel like this. What's feeling got to do with faith? You hear people say sometimes, well, I'm not emotional. And I say, well, of course, one of the most distinctive men in the world always said he wasn't emotional. Oh, who's that? Hitler. <laughs> Hitler always said, I'm not emotional, nothing moves me. I'm a stoic. No, you don't have feelings, but sometimes you feel on double the world, sometimes you don't. Does that change the color of the sun? Huh? If you feel down, does a bird uh, forget to sing? Does a dog forget to bark? Hmm? Does the mailman forget to jump just because you're feeling down? So happens the world outside still going round. Isn't that amazing? That however you feel, the world is still functioning normally. And Satan wants us to live by feelings. Now, if you live by feelings, you don't need faith. And if you live by faith, you don't need feeling. When it comes down to the nitty-gritty, it's this. Well, however you feel, whatever has come, just say, well, hold it, Satan, a minute, you old liar. I want to check on this. Uh, has God turned his face from me? No. Have I grieved the Spirit? No. Have I bitterness in my heart again? So? No, no. That's my emotional life. It may be very different from my spiritual life. There are times when you may have ecstasy, excessive ecstasy. The psalmist had that kind of thing. Surely you won't lift up your head. Man, I sometimes like I think I'd like to have slipped up behind him at night, you know, looking after the sheep, strumming his, his harp and, and singing the 23rd Psalm and some of those amazing psalms that he wrote. I'd love to have heard him, but I remember also he said on one occasion, Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Huh? Mm. I hit the bottom, zero. Oh. Even my heart is in tune. Mm. Even the sheep won't look at me this morning. Oh boy, I'm having a rough time. Huh? And Saul is after me. He's going to kill me. I've heard a report about it. Oh, everything's against me. Hmm? Mr. Chadwick, I went to school. Mr. Chadwick was the president. His favorite hymn was, God is the refuge of his face. When storms of sharp distress invade, <coughs> Ere we can offer our complaints, behold him present with his, his aid. Let mountains from their seats be hurled down to the deeps and buried there. Convulsions shake the solid earth. Our faith shall never yield to fear. Well, isn't that it? I mean, am I, am I, am I going to be tossed around like the man down the street there? <clears throat> sure, he's got emotions, he's got feelings, but he doesn't know God. Calamity comes in his life, he goes to pieces. Adversity comes and immediately says, why me? 
whereas we can go into the presence of the king and say, thank you, Lord, for sending this. I don't know what's in it, but all things work together for good. Huh? Well, we don't always say that, do we? We think that good things work together for good. Or, on the other hand, you know, uh, uh, well, well, something goes wrong, somebody says, well, cheer up, you know, all things work together for good. In other words, I don't know, I know any answers, but I do know the scripture. All things work together for good, huh? But what about when somebody gives you a thousand dollars? Do you rejoice? Because that's one of the things that works together for good. But we don't look at the good thing. It's the same with people quoting scripture. Oh, what I want to do is something. You better be careful because you know you'll reap what you sow. We <laughs> will. Well, then all the good things you've sown, you're going to reap them. But we always make it sound as all that. It's only the bad things that you reap. <laughs> Everybody says that, don't they? Well, you reap what you sow. Oh, praise God, that's great. <laughs> I'm going to read what I've sown. I've been pouring my adoration out to the Lord. I've lots of reasons why I shouldn't, but I've been adoring Him, magnifying Him. Oh, I needed uh, really some money for something, but I heard of somebody in need, and I gave it out. And, uh, no, I haven't got the money back, but I did hear indirectly that they said they'd been praying for two weeks for that $15, and it suddenly came in. Boy, don't I get a kick out of that? Don't I get a lift out of that? Show you so what you read. My old granny used to sit in the chimney corner in England and, and sing an old, old Methodist hymn. So flowers and flowers will blossom around you wherever you go. So weeds and the weeds reap the harvest. You reap whatsoever you sow. It's a moral universe. <clears throat> what was it the old saint said, uh, one of the saint, uh, some old rascal maybe, uh, said years ago that, that the mills of God uh, grind slowly, that they grind exceedingly fine. Well, I changed that to the mills of God grind slowly, but they always grind on time. God's never late, but he's never in a hurry. I guess if you're really honest tonight, I'm not saying you're dishonest, but if you're, <laughs> I'm just implying it, that uh, <coughs> if you're really honest, there have been times in your life when you've prayed and you've felt, look, I wish I could give God a push. i never forget our Saturday night testimony meeting. We used to always say, well, remember Saturday night, it's a say-so meeting. It's a say-so meeting. Yeah, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. <laughs> so we had a say-so meeting every Saturday night. We got maybe a couple of hundred people, and well, we had some lively, just testimony. You know, uh, we used to say, like John Wesley, don't tell us your grandfather was a bishop 45 years ago. Don't testify beyond last Saturday if you testify. Don't go over what you went over. What has happened in your life? Have you been up? Have you been down? Have you been in victory? Have you been defeated? Be up to date with your testimony. I remember this girl standing up, Mary Bland, the name was. She was the ordinary. She had a little, I don't know, six or seven piece office. She's a sweet girl. She's married, lives in a little island off the coast of England right now. And I remember Mary stood up and she said, but, well, I know the Lord is going to say my, my, my daddy. You know he's a drunkard and he beats my mother and he does this and that. And, that. and I know he's going to do it. She said, and she stopped and everybody thought, what are you going to do? Start crying. She said, but sometimes I feel I'd like to give the Lord a push. <laughs> you know. And I, I saw a lot of people raise their eyebrows saying, you know, saying, God, are you a sister? I know what you mean. <laughs> I'd like to give him a push. <laughs> you know, you know. But the good book says, let patience have a perfect work. Yes. You know the old story, Lord, I want patience. I want it now. <laughs> you know, deliver it immediately. Instant patience, instant maturity, <laughs> instant perfection. Isn't it nice, the scripture says, that we walk by faith, not leap? A lot of us want to leap. No, it's a walk. Oh, mounting up with wings as eagles, great. Boy, getting over there, you know, be able to pitch, pitch on that highest peak up there, look around and see the whole world and see the on top of everything. Huh? Mount up with wings as eagles, that's great. And then it tones down a bit, running and not be worried, then walking and not faint. Oh, isn't that tiring? Mm. Oh, just walking, walking, your feet taking. Oh, that's it. Other guy's going past in his Lincoln, and here I am walking. <laughs> it's the test. It's the test. Come to walk together, except they be agreed. Test. That walking is a great test. You see, we're, we're all the time. We wanted to take shortcuts. Miss the first base, get to the second one, or miss the second, get to the third, or something. And yet, God takes us round every base. You see, once he's purified our hearts and purified our motives and purified our desires, and you can honestly say, Lord, I know my heart is pure because there's nothing you can ask of me that I won't do. I have no rebellion in my heart on any level at all. You've purified my heart. And I believe that just as I uh, was boys, uh, 
there was a stream in England and we used to go uh, there, you know, we'd find a rock maybe as big as this and uh, lift it out of the dirt and we'd throw it in the stream and, you know, as soon as it got in the stream, the current of the stream would start washing all the yellow filth off it. We'd go the next day and play at the same place and somebody'd say, hey, Raven, remember that white rock? There it is, you see. You know what? That rock was exactly the same as when I threw it in, except it was purified. And as long as it stayed under the floor of that water, it stayed pure. There was nothing to... the Old Testament, what was, it, what was it sacrifice? The sacrifice was a dead sacrifice. You come back to that stupendous statement in Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your body a living sacrifice. Well, where does life is action? You have a living heart, you have a living mind, you have living emotions, you have a living will. And yet day by day you stay there on that altar. The only way you can put it yourself on the altar tomorrow is that you took yourself off the altar today. And yet we're to be a living sacrifice. And as long as we stay under the floor of the blood, I believe we stay continually clean. Now that doesn't mean we come to maturity, that's purity. Purity is the gateway to maturity. Maturity will never, now I don't care how old we live to be, nobody, nobody is going to graduate in the school of God this side of eternity. Here is the scripture here. I was reading it today. In Ezekiel 36. <coughs> as the last scripture. Ezekiel 36 verse 23 I will sanctify my great name which was profaned among the heathen which ye have profaned in the midst of them and the heathen shall know that I am the Lord saith the Lord God when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes you see there's a dual sanctification the Old Testament sanctification was to separate a thing for a holy purpose remember in John 17 Jesus says for their sake I sanctify myself but the sanctification there is not purification because he did not need purification He's separating himself now for a special task. He's finished his ministry to the world. He's finished the healing. He's finished the miraculous. He's finished his preaching. And now he's separating himself to this holy task of redemption, of going forth to suffer and to die. Okay? I shall be sanctified in you before the eyes of the heathen. God's going to put us on display. For I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries, and I will bring you into your own land. Now, here's the promise. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean. From all your filthiness, from all your idols will I cleanse you. I will give you a new heart. I will, a, a new heart also will I give you. A new spirit I will put within you. I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments. Now, if that is, isn't one of what Paul talks about, the exceeding great and precious promises, I don't, I don't know what is. But, it can only be done as we come in total submission to God. As we hunger and thirst after righteousness, as we come up this ladder from poverty, and hungering and thirsting for righteousness, and his work meekness in us, and all arrogance is gone, and all self-seeking is gone, and he purges us through and through, that word is very strong. The Hebrew word in, in uh, um, Psalm 51, where, 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 and it's, a, it's a, uh, a psalm I haven't preached on for years. I may do, may do it next week, the week after, because I love that 51st psalm. And, and, and remember what David says, Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Now, if I, were to, if I were to wash this desk here, obviously I'd just wash the surface of it. If you have, I get a cloth and soap and wash it off there. If I, if I take this and wash it, I put it in a solution, and the solution goes in and it comes out at the other side, it goes through, it goes through every pore, and it's very different. I can't send the water to purge through the wood, but I can put this in a solution and purge it through and through, and that's what Paul, that, pardon me, that's what David says, purge me through and through, purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean, wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. I used to puzzle over that, but the only white thing I'd ever seen in England was snow. My goodness, some winters it, it was great. We couldn't go to school. Snow was so deep. I used to look at it 
And when the storm was over, I'd go out and get a piece of wood or something, and I'd push the snow on one side, and I'd look at it, and you know, the, the sun would come, and it would sparkle like diamonds, and it would look blue in some areas, and I'd think, oh, isn't it beautiful? And I thought, well, yeah, we were reading in church the other day, wash me, and I should be whiter than the snow. And yet, no, scientifically, the scientists say that every flake of snow, and it, as you know, there's never been two s snowflakes alike in history. The some man in this country has a collection of about 350. You say, where does he keep them? Well, not in the oven for sure. Uh, he, he catches them and they come down and, and he's, he's frozen them and he's kept them on little, uh, I don't know, they are bits of cellophane or something in a refrigerator. And every one of them, I think, one, uh, every, isn't it, every snowflake has five points, never six, never seven. And the variation is, is fantastic. Sometimes you get a book with them in. And yet science says that every flake of snow has at least one almost infinitesimal spot of dirt in it because when it comes down to the atmosphere it collects something in the atmosphere that's why when you have a, a heavy snow you always have a good good hay crop now we don't get snow down here but in other countries they say oh that's great you know what snow does it makes a blanket for the earth the air can't get through and it warms the earth it warms the roots then when it melts it goes down into the ground and it's got a chemical, it's got a fertilizer with it. But David said, if you wash me truly, truly, that's a great psalm. It's got, I'm going to preach on it one Sunday sometime, I don't know when, I've, I've no more engagements up there, I don't know when. <laughs> they usually give me a list to preach on me, Sunday, you know, five, five, five months, once a month. Uh, preach one Sunday a month. I don't have any more, that's okay, but it works out enough. But, wash me and I shall be wiping the snow. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. <coughs> and then when you've been working down here, you do work sometimes, don't you? <coughs> Out in the dirt, I mean. And you're coming all messed up and you feel smelly, you've been around cows or something, and then you go and have your bay and they come out and go, oh boy, then I feel great now. Huh? Got rid of all that dirt and dust and grime, your hair's nice and at least as nice as it could be, and uh, <laughs> uh, you, you, you just feel clean and lovely. You know. And how much more wonderful is it when God has cleansed us, when He when He's pardoned all our sins, when He's taken the record of our iniquity and cast it behind His back, when He's come inside and cleaned us up and then come to indwell us by His Spirit and He knows that He has the rule over us. Because after all what we're talking about, pure in heart, is only something that's part of this kingdom that Jesus is preaching about. And you know, you can't go through this marvelous, marvelous Sermon on the Mount without realizing that the Sermon on the Mount is related to another mount called Calvary. After all, everything that's in the Sermon on the Mount was in the life of Jesus. What did he get? He got a cross. We don't live in a world where there's meekness. We don't live in a world that wants purity. We don't live in a world where they want righteousness. And if you and I are going to walk as God wants us to walk, talk like God wants us to talk, live like God wants us to live, not like my buddy here at, at uh, last day's ministry, but as God wants me to live. I can't always eat when they eat. I can't always talk when they talk. I, I can be again outside of the camp while I'm in the camp. But God is setting a, a standard in my life to, to show me how to keep everything in subjection, my body, my mind, my emotions, every part of my being. And it can only be done as the Spirit of God has come, applied the blood of Jesus, and he's come to take up residence in us that we can go out and, and the good old book says he can keep us unspotted from the world not only make us pure but keep us pure there's nothing in the world com com comparable to the finished work of Jesus Christ there's no purgative like the purging blood of Jesus Christ and as long as we stay in submission you know we sing it it's easy to sing it, isn't it? perfect submission always at rest but there's no much good singing it if we're rebellious on the inside perfect submission I'm perfectly in submission to the will of God tonight and I want to stay like that <clears throat> and tomorrow morning there'll be all the grace I need for tomorrow not tomorrow's grace today like the man in the wilderness you know they couldn't say well I need to sleep tomorrow morning I'm getting up too early I'm going to get too lots of manna stuff in my pocket I got up in the morning found it a pocket full of worms it went bad overnight and a lot of us want to store up for tomorrow. Well, as a sense in which you can, you can build yourself up in your most holy faith, but tomorrow you can't breathe for tomorrow, can you? You've got to take tomorrow as it comes, and, and, and God's abundant grace is there. The only thing is, I shall be higher up the mountain tomorrow than I am today when we sing hymns again. 
I think often we sing lies, I'm pressing on the upward way and new heights I'm gaining every day. Is, is that true? Have you gained some height today or have you slipped down the mountainside? Still praying as I onward bound, Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. There's always much land to be possessed. Isn't enough to cover the lintels and the doorposts. Israel did that and not one of them made it to the promised land. Well, a couple of them. They perished in the wilderness and that wasn't God's will. God's will was they got into a land of victory, they licked every one of the 31 kings that were there, and they went on to possess their possessions. But we still got too many Christians that are, that are in the, what I call in the playpen. Just want to be saved from past sins, just want to be saved from hell, and, well, that's it. God wants us to go on to maturity. God wants us to develop in grace, grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And while we have inward strife and inward warfare and civil war with our own hearts, with pride, with prejudice, with bitterness, with covetousness, with jealousy, whatever there is that inward strife, we cannot fight God's battles because we are fighting our own battles. And therefore God has to put those things to death, make us pure, fill us with his spirit, keep us pure. And Paul says, Faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. Father, we thank you tonight for our meditation. Oh, how wonderful that you should not cast us away. We have all been a disappointment to you at some time or other. We have all failed to grasp all of the promises. Again, Lord, we say that we do not want to run with the rest of the crowd. We if you raised up this fellowship you raised it for some reason particular peculiar reason as your word says and I pray that Lord your purpose will be fulfilled that in every dimension our lives will develop that Lord you won't have to say to us in that great day I had many things to tell you but you couldn't bear them you got so busy with lesser things keep us in our, our priorities right we pray grant Lord we shall seek your face continually we shall seek to love you and to honor you and to obey you and to satisfy your heart. And we'll give you praise in Jesus' name.